Well, can I add uh, my welcome to uh, what is now a really special occasion uh, in our annual academic year, uh, the, uh, the joint lecture uh, co-hosted uh, with the apothecaries. Um, I, I've just realized I'm almost at the end of my fifth year, uh, so this must be my fifth, if I can count. Uh, but of course, we host them alternately. Uh, so it moves from Apothecary's Hall to, uh, to this chapel. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words, and I'm afraid most of you in the audience will, will know this, but uh, uh, Keats himself, of course, born in 1795, uh, he, he had already uh, undertaken a five-year apprenticeship to an apothecary in North London and was intending on a career in medicine when he registered age 19, so he... He started as an apothecary when he was very young, but at the age of 19, he registered as a student dresser at Guy's uh, in October 1815, and I suspect we'll hear more about that in the lecture. The Keats Memorial Lecture was created in 1969 to recognize the life and poetical works of the poet, uh, uh, to me, one of the greatest poets ever to write in English. Um, his output wasn't enormous, but when you think of the great poems that you know by heart, uh, quite a number are by him. So I think you can all do arithmetic, and we'll have worked out that tonight, tonight's talk marks the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the lecture, and we are absolutely delighted to be hosting it here at King's. As I've already said, the lecture was set up jointly by the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries, uh, the Royal College of Surgeons of England and Guy's Hospital Medical School, and it rotates now biannually between the Society and King's. Uh, for those of you who, who uh, uh, are new to King's, King's being the successor institution to the United Medical Schools of Guy's and St. Thomas's and King's College Medical School. I'd like to extend a special uh, welcome to a, an old colleague, uh, Professor Martin Rosser, uh, Master of the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries, uh, and an old friend, Michael Farthing, who is now the uh, senior warden. Welcome to you both. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge our own professor, Brian Hurwitz, uh, for his work in uh, ensuring uh, that the lecture runs smoothly, and I think Brian, uh, everything associated with it. Um, the roll call of Keats Memorial Lecturers is incredibly distinguished, and tonight's speaker is no exception. So a few words about Nicholas Rowe. He is a literary scholar of renown, of romanticist culture, and an acclaimed biographer of the poet. He is professor of English literature at the University of St. Andrews, a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and of the British Academy. Nicholas Rowe is chairman of the Keats Foundation and a trustee of the Wordsworth Trust. He has published several acclaimed books on Keats, including John Keats and the Culture of Dissent, John Keats, a, a, a New Life. And he has a particular interest, and I think this will be of interest to many of us here, in the poet's early education and his experiences as a surgical dresser here at Guy's. Uh, he has collected studies uh, in the edited volume of John Keats and the Medical Imagination, which arose from a two-day scholarly symposium he organized at Guy's, and I had the opportunity to read some of his work before this lecture, and I think to those of us with a poetical and a medical background, it is of incredible interest. Uh, tonight's talk, which I've inadvertently started, uh, will, be taught, will be entitled uh, John Keats, Places, Patterns, and Poetical Purposes. Uh, after his talk, I'll return to the rostrum uh, because he's agreed to take questions for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and then, for those of you who can join us, we'll have a reception. So please uh, welcome uh, Nicholas Rowe, uh, our eminent speaker, uh, for the 50th Keats Lecture. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Principal, and um, I'm grateful to the Worshipful, so so Worshipful Society of Apothecaries and to King's College uh, for inviting me to present this 50th Keats Memorial Lecture. I'm delighted and honoured to be here. 
Um, I know Guy's Hospital and its Keats associations, of course, but I've never been in the chapel, so it's a particular delight to um, be able to speak here uh, this evening. Um, my title is John Keats, Places, Patterns and Poetical Purposes. And I'm beginning with a, an anecdote that dates from, uh, I think, late 1816. John Keats once postponed a meeting with the painter Joseph Seven, explaining that I particularly want to look into some beautiful scenery for poetical purposes. Keats was heading out of town, getting away on the move to make poetry. Most paintings of Keats don't capture his physically active and restless presence. Seven's famous miniature, just here, shows Keats seated with a sheet of paper. And the two portraits that Seven made after Keats' death are studies of sedentary life as well. One of them shows him reading at Wentworth Place, Hampstead. There he is. The other has him sitting on a slope listening to nightingales. We see a suburban poet safe at home in a suburban interior surrounded by a suburban landscape under the same old suburban moon. We can call this Keatsland. The two chairs in the parlor at Keats House Hampstead are arranged exactly as in Seven's picture, forming a kind of still life without Keats. The reality of Keats's life was much more riskily unsettled. It comprised a series of travels and poetic tests and trials that were conducted in a succession of temporary lodgings. Like Burns and like Clare and Wordsworth, Keats's poetic vision was anchored in his experience of the local and the immediate. The word here appears in his poems 160 times, to save you counting. But unlike Burns and Clare and Wordsworth, Keats never speaks or writes about his own native place. His childhood was passed at Moorfields and Craven Street on the northern edge of London, then slightly further afield to the north at Enfield, Ponders End and Edmonton. Instead of roots, Keats experienced a series of dislocations that arguably equipped him to make good with whatever was to hand. So each of the four books of Endymion was written in a different place, at Carisbrook on the Isle of Wight, at Margate, at Hampstead, Oxford, Burford Bridge, and Box Hill. Places shaped the landscapes and the forms of his poems. Endymion gets underway on an April morning at Carisbrook with its landscape of clear rills, rushes, fenny, ivy banks, and cork copse-clad valleys, and then meanders through 4,000 lines that respond to the various places of composition. His first published poem, To Solitude, contrasts the inner city and suburban nature, much as his, his message of excuse for Seven had done. I Stood Tiptoe describes scenes and sights on Hampstead Heath, Isabella transforms Tynmouth into Tuscany, and Lamia, set in classical Corinth, draws scenic props from the ancient English cathedral city, Winchester. The homely lintel of the lover's chamber door may be a glimpse of Keats's Winchester lodgings. The fretted splendor of each nook and niche comes from the cathedral and the college buildings, while Corinth's, Corinth's thronged streets and carriages with dazzling spokes mingle Grecian antiquity with the streets of an English provincial city. Even the cider press into autumn had a local habitation. Uh, it was kept in the precincts of St Cross Hospital, uh, which is just down the river uh, from the centre of Winchester. So place could be enabling to Keats's poetical purposes and by the same token, it could also cause him problems. He had to get away from Hampstead to begin Endymion, and after an unsuccessful start on the Isle of Wight, he quit Carisbrook and headed to Margate, where he knew he could compose productively. So I want to ask why these patterns of place and displacement should have been necessary to his creativity. In this Keats Memorial Lecture, I explore some Keatsian places and poetical purposes during 1818 
by way of suggesting some of the complex ways in which place is registered in his poems. I also want to offer you an energetic and active Keats who is very different from the placid, placid passive poet who was once said to have had no interest in anything. Throughout, I want to emphasize for you how creatively unsettled Keats's life actually was, as he wrote his poetry in a sequence of transitory settings, literally, one might almost say, writing poems on the road. During 1818, Keats was at Hampstead, London, Exeter, Tynmouth, Torquay, Honiton, Bridport, Hampstead, Redbourne, Liverpool, he's coming onto the map behind me now, Liverpool and Lancaster, Ambleside, on the shores of Derwent Water and the slopes of Skiddaw, at Castle Rigg Stone Circle, in Keswick, Carlisle, Dumfries, Port Patrick, Donaghadee, Belfast, Alloway, Glasgow, Loch Lomond, Rest and Be Thankful, which proved not to be a bar, Loch Orr, Oban, Carrera, Mull, Iona, Staffa, and Fort William. Having climbed all 4,411 feet of Ben Nevis, plus a little more, he walked up the Great Glen to Inverness, to Bewley with its priory, the Black Isle, and finally Cromarty on the cold North Sea. John Keats in Cromarty, of all places, and there it is, and the little harbour uh, where he set sail back south to London. Keats used to speak of his reach as a poet, drawing the term from the reach of a boxer's punch in prize fighting. We could also link poetic reach into, to his travels from one end of Britain to the other, to the summit of Ben Nevis, where he wrote a sonnet, and out to the many Western islands already implicated with bards and lyrical realms of gold in his sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Much have I travelled in the realms of gold. Keats's famous sonnet begins with four words that establish a link between physical and imaginative journeys. And indeed, the sonnet itself was composed as Keats footed his way across London from Clerkenwell to Southwark. But where did this imaginative dynamic come from? The answer, I think, and as we might perhaps expect, can be found in his early childhood, when he was living on the shifting suburban edge of northern London. It's important that the family business was linked to travel. Keats's maternal grandfather owned a large livery stable, equivalent now to a car rental agency, and his father was the stable manager. Mobility was in Keats's blood, and he had little experience or memory of a settled home life. The death of his father and his mother's disappearance meant that his childhood was divided between school at Enfield and holidays at his grandmother's home. After school came apprenticeship to Dr. Hammond at Edmonton, and this was most likely, I think, for just three years. Uh, nevertheless, um, those three years were formative for his creative life, and I'll try to explain why. Charles Cowden Clark, that is Keats's former schoolmaster, takes up the story um, in his uh, 1861 essay about Keats. He remembers that the distance between our residences being so short, that is between Edmonton and Enfield, I encouraged Keats's inclination to come over when he could be spared. And in consequence, I saw him about five or six times a month. It was on one of these visits that Clark read out Spencer's Epith Epithalamian and Keats took away a copy of The Fairy Queen, the poem more th that more than any other determined him to become a poet. What I want to suggest, therefore, is that from the outset, Keats associated his discovery of poetry and the discoveries that poetry enables with travelling, originally from Edmonton across the fields to the school at Enfield, and subsequently to any and all of the places he found conducive to poetical purposes. In his early phase, when he was here at Guy's Hospital, 
He headed to the landscape north of the city and eventually to Lee Hunt's home at the Vale of Health. This is the poet's house that is celebrated in sleep and poetry from where Keats tells us he had many miles on foot to fare in returning to his hospital duties at Guy's. His epic walking tour of Scotland in summer 1818 was an ambitious extension of his more modest suburban paths to poetry. And it was planned for poetical purposes in that Keats hoped to gather sublime images for his epic poem Hyperion. Like Wordsworth, Keats was aware of how footing slow through a landscape could suggest poetic and intellectual advance. And in one of his letters, Keats likened the composition of Tintern Abbey to a resting place. To this point was Wordsworth come when he wrote Tintern Abbey, Keats explains. Aware that Wordsworth's poem was composed during a tour, as the poem's title tells us, and that more figuratively, the poem constitutes a journey into the heart and nature of man. Associated with Keats's ideas of poetic travel were patterns and motifs that structured his imaginative life, the inner city and escape from it, repeated visits to Margate, to the Isle of Wight, and possibly to Tynmouth on two occasions. More broadly speaking, there is, I think, a westerly tendency in Keats's patterns of travelling that he associated with the many western islands of verse. And when I was going through this earlier today, it reminded me that the family tradition held that uh, the Keats family came from as far west as you can get in England. That is Land's End. That's what Keats's sister Fanny thought, um, that Thomas Keats um, was from Land's End. It's significant, I think, that Keats's first published poem, The Sonnet to Solitude, was a manifesto for creative mobility. The poem recapitulates Keats's footsteps from the city's murky buildings to contemplate the steep, slopes, swell and span of an open landscape. We can place the poem's localities here in murky Southwark, south of the River Thames, and on Hampstead Heath with what Keats calls wide wandering for the greediest eye to peer about upon variety. Whereas Keats said that Southwark was a beastly place in dirt, turnings and windings, Hampstead's wide wandering was open to the horizon's crystal air. As always with Keats, such dirt and crystal contrasts were conducive to creativity, and this may explain why for him traveling diverse locations and poetic purposes were so closely linked together. Equally, Keats's imagined places, those untrodden regions of his mind, can shape poetic narratives and lyrical trajectories. Initially grounded here, where men sit and hear each other groan, the Nightingale Ode takes flight on poetry's viewless wings and eventually arrives at a place of pure imagination. Here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. Now that, that wonderful suggest, suggestion of light from heaven with breezes blown creates its magic from a commonplace phrase, a light breeze. Keats deploys it again in the final stanza of To Autumn, where we hear that in a wailful choir, the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. Gently reminding us of the soft dying day, the phrase as the light wind lives or dies suggests that the poem's imaginative impulse may be gradually fading too, and by implication that its final stanza is actually enacting the process of seasonal change and transience witnessed in each of its lines. Contrasting and complementary, Keats's beastly place in dirt, turnings and windings, and his winding mossy ways, are based on a single image, the labyrinth, known to him from L'Empriere's classical dictionary 
as a building whose numerous passages and perplexing windings render the escape from it difficult. There were four very famous among the ancients, Lomprière says, and these were broadly speaking of two types. The labyrinth at Lemnos was admirable for beauty and splendor, and so was the Egyptian labyrinth. The beauty and the art of the building were almost beyond belief, Lomprière says, as were its vaulted halls, each with six doors, beyond which were said to be 3,000 chambers. Such were the labyrinths of beauty and art. Then there was the labyrinth of Crete, built by Daedalus. This, Lomprière says, was the place of confinement for Daedalus himself and the prison of the Minotaur. Daedalus was the most ingenious artist of his age, according to Lomprière, and as we know, he escaped from the labyrinth with his son Icarus on wings of feathers and wax. Keats's phrase, the viewless wings of poesy, in his Nightingale Ode, comes from Milton, and at a bit of a stretch, might also be said to allude to Daedalus's escape from his prison. More certain is the fact that the idea of the labyrinth was embodied for Keats in his early poems by the winding lanes and alleys of inner city London, the urban labyrinth from which he escaped into poetry. So I want to suggest that those classical labyrinths embodied for Keats by the winding London streets were prototypes for Keats's peculiarly labyrinthine poetics. Receiving a laurel crown from Lee Hunt excited thoughts of poetry's Delphic labyrinth. We hear in Sleep and Poetry of how the imagination into most lovely labyrinths will be gone. And elsewhere, Keats writes of poetry's labyrinths of sweet utterance. The narrative of Endymion and the formal architecture, the passages and chambers of the Eve of St. Agnes have labyrinthine qualities. So do the more fanciful mazy footsteps, mazy range, mazy dance and mazy world of some of his earliest poems. If labyrinthine loveliness lends its allure to the imaginative life, it can also represent the dangers of living too intensely in and through the imagination. As we read into the second part of Lamia, aware of passion's passing bell, Lysias tells Lamia that he is striving how to entangle, trammel up, and snare your soul in mine, and labyrinth you there. One can be imprisoned by imagination's labyrinths, as Daedalus discovered. And when Keats described Southwark's turnings and windings as beastly, perhaps he was thinking of the Minotaur's labyrinthine home. As this sketch map of Southwark shows us, the Maze and Maze Pond were streets that Keats walked each day while he was studying at Guy's Hospital. His lodgings at St. Thomas's Street and Dean Street were in the centre of this perplexing network, and it was from here that he breezed away into beautiful scenery for poetical purposes. That juxtaposition of physical constraint and imaginative release, evident in Keats's first published poem to Solitude, reappears throughout his career. Tellingly, he was most poetically productive month by month and line by line when he was employed full-time here at the center of the Southwark Labyrinth in Guy's Hospital. Only slightly less productive were his 60 days living at Tynmouth in England's West Country from March to May of 1818. There's uh, Tynmouth in Keats's day, um, uh, an image that I think actually dates from 1818, so that's pretty much what he knew when he lived there. With a population of 4,000, Tynmouth was a fashionable seaside resort. There were 12 bathing machines, and you can see them just there, look along the far side of the beach. 12 bathing machines, hot baths, an assembly room, a public library that took the London papers, including Hunt's Examiner, and a theater where the most famous actor of the day, Edmund Keane, had scratched his name on the green room wall. Temperate air and sea breezes were believed to waft off 
all injurious particles, but what Keats experienced were weeks of Devonshire rain that made it a splashy, rainy, misty, snowy, foggy, haily, floody, muddy, slipshod county. On one night, he lay awake listening to yet another downpour, imagining himself drowned and rotted like a grain of wheat. He stayed here just over eight weeks, during which he wrote some ten poems and sent a dozen letters to friends in London. At least one of these poems is a major work, that is Isabella or the Pot of Basil. While the tragic action of Isabella takes place in 14th century Florence, its setting is drawn from the landscape around Tynmouth. We are told that Lorenzo, with light steps, went up a western hill and bade the sun farewell, an imagined location that was almost certainly based on Sheldon Hill, prominent to the west of Tynmouth, overlooking the shipmast forests that you can see there. Keats also tells us how the River Arno's stream, the River Arno's stream gurgles through straightened banks and still doth fan itself with dancing bulrush and the bream keeps head against the freshets. If you've been to Florence, you'll know that the broad and stately River Arno does not gurgle under dancing bulrushes. A West Country freshet, one of many Keats had seen and heard in the sodden spring of 1818, certainly does. When Keats wrote, I see and sing by my own eyes inspired, in his most overtly re visionary poem, Ode to Psyche, it's difficult to resist the surmise that he meant just that. His haunted forest boughs and branched thoughts grew from pines and dark clustered trees that he had actually seen. Seamus Heaney said that he had discovered poetry through reading Keats, and Keats's poetry, like Heaney's, is most often the music of what happens. So having suggested how intricately place and poetics are entwined in Keats, I want to outline now how place and poetic thought more particularly are linked before moving to Keats and his Scottish tour in the summer of 1818. Isabella shows us that like Southwark, Tynmouth had swiftly infiltrated his imagination and the place also advanced his thinking about the imaginative life. Strangely and strikingly, Keats described this little coastal town of 4,000 souls as the labyrinth of Tynmouth. With its narrow streets and alleyways, it is still now very difficult to find one's way around. I gave a paper there in February last year, went there the day before to ascertain why, where the Ice Factory Theatre was, which took some finding, uh, came back the next day and I couldn't, couldn't find it at all. So um, it, it, is, it is actually true. Um, Keats sat indoors under hatches because of incessant rain, started to form from the labyrinth of Tynmouth an image for his thinking about poetry and the poetic life. I have ever been too sensible of the labyrinthine path to eminence in art, he tells his painter friend Benjamin Hayden writing to his poet friend John Hamilton Reynolds about shared creative endeavors. He says, you've been going through the same labyrinth that I have. Keats's recent branchings from that intellectual labyrinth were his reflections on Wordsworth and Milton and his idea of human life as a large mansion of many apartments in which we proceed through a series of chambers and dark passageways, each with many doors. That mansion is usually to said to come from the Bible, from St. John's Gospel. I think it may also derive from the Egyptian labyrinth with its 3,000 chambers and somewhat less exotic and imposing, 20 the Strand, Tynmouth, with its three floors structured round a central staircase off which the doors lead into various rooms. That's where they stayed. And outside those lodgings was the labyrinth of Tynmouth, a physical embodiment of the labyrinthine path to eminence in art through which Keats felt himself to be edging forwards, feeling the burden of the mystery, following Wordsworth along the dark passages of existence. Labyrinth, labyrinths and labyrinthine are among Keats's favourite words. 
They are orally and orally gratifying and easy to accommodate to an iambic rhythm and trembles through my labyrinthine hair, is one of his lines using this word. Appearing some 10 times in his poems, the word labyrinth occurs just three times in his letters, and those three letters were all written at Tynmouth. Confined by the Tynmouth labyrinth, enveloped in clouds, Keats was also composing Isabella and projecting his summer tour of Scotland. As formerly in the maze of Southwark, he was plotting a remarkable odyssey for poetical purposes that would prepare him for his greatest, greatest creative challenge so far, his attempt at an epic poem. There is a direct correlation here between the reach of Keats's epic ambition and the daunting scale of the journey he envisaged for the summer of 1818. Accompanied by Charles Armitage Brown, on Thursday the 25th of June, Keats set off on foot from Lancaster on what would prove to be a 600 mile hike. They were on their way to Wordsworth's Lake District and his home at Rydal Mount, then northwards to Robert Burns's Dumfries, the Scottish Highlands, the Isles of Mull and Iona and Fingal's Cave on Staffa. Here in the far off Hebrides, Keats went footing slow through the many western islands his Chapman's Homer sonnet had associated with the poetic life. Contrarywise, places through which he was now walking would help to create poetic insights both immediately and in the longer term. He wrote 15 poems on this tour, of which nine are what we could call significant works. On visiting the tomb of Burns, Old Meg, She Was a Gypsy, A Song About Myself, To Ailsa Rock, This Mortal Body of a Thousand Days, Lines Written in the Highlands, Not Aladdin Magian, Read Me a Lesson Muse, and Stanzas on Some Skulls in Bewley Abbey. He also envisaged using the mountains of the Lake District and the Highlands as the backdrop for his epic poem, a plan that Hyperion shows was fulfilled. And there was a third creative dynamic to the tour, the one that's not often considered. This is Keats's enthusiastic explorations of ruined abbeys and priories at Lincluden and Dundreden and Glenluce. Uh, this is Glenluce that you can see here, um, moving around a little bit, but you get the idea of it. Glen Luce, Cross Raguel, and uh, Iona and Bewley. These uh, antiquarian forays into Gothic interiors contributed to Keats's idea of Fingal's Cave as a cathedral of the sea. And what he fastened on to was the idea that these columns at Glen Luce were composed of um, small pillars that are bound together. His image for it was um, a bundle of twigs or matchsticks and he saw the same structure in the stone of um, Fingal's Cave. These antiquarian forays into Gothic interiors um, contributed to his idea of Fingal's Cave and further ahead helped him materialize the architecture of the Eve of St. Agnes with its chapel aisle, its carved angel, its portal doors, buttress, broad hall pillar, lowly arched way, little moonlight room, closet, balustrade, and foot-worn stones. They landed at Mull on Grass Point with some 37 miles to go to Iona. That is, if this would settle down, just here on Grass Point. They walked across the island of Carrera and landed here and walked right the way up Glenmore, across here and out to Iona. That little green circle is helpful um, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. A most wretched walk, Keats called it. And uh, on the second day on the island, Thursday the 23rd, Keats was breakfasting here in a remote farmhouse called Derina Cullen, the ancient house under the waterfall, where he began a letter to his brother. He was writing it in that room, the public room of the house, uh, which was inhabited until 
1940. Now, if you look at my biography of Keats, this is where I begin the story. And shortly after the Christmas following the publication of the biography, I had a letter um, from a person I'd never heard of before, but I now know, Christine Harding, saying she'd brought her husband um, a copy of the book, not knowing anything about it or what was in it. Her husband ran, sat down to read it on Christmas afternoon, and he said, the book begins at Derry Cullen, and Christine Harding is the descendant of the family that last lived in uh, the farmhouse and knew its, um, knew its long history, uh, and she sent me some photographs of it when it was still inhabited in uh, the 1930s. After the shepherd's hut where they had slept the previous night, uh, Derrina Cullen was by comparison a mansion, as Keats told his brother John, Tom, albeit not one with many apartments. The next stretch of their journey took them 16 miles to the boat across to Iona or Icolmkill, then as now a place of great antiquarian fascination. And there it is. Um, you can see the roof is obviously on the church now. It wasn't in Keats's day. It was already uh, a fashionable destination for visitors, and it all astonished Keats. Here on this tiny island, surrounded by the stormy Atlantic, were the ruins of a fine cathedral church of cloisters, colleges, monasteries, and nunneries. He described for his brother Tom a spot in the churchyard where they say 61 kings are buried, 48 Scotch from Fergus II to Macbeth, eight Irish, four Norwegian, and one French. They lie in rows compact. Then we were shown other matters of later date, but still very ancient. Many tombs of Highland chieftains, their effigies in armor, face upwards, black and moss covered. Abbots and bishops of the island, always one of the chief clans. Surrounded, surrounding the ruins was a desolate hinterland of windswept rocks, windswept, windswept trees, rocks, reeds, and sea foam all reminiscent of James Macpherson's mournful poems of Ossian, as were these carved stone effigies of the kings and warriors, Ossian's chiefs of old, the race that are no more. In months to come, Iona's warriors would reappear as the pale kings and princes of La Belle Dame Sans Merci, a poem that was saturated by Keats's Scottish experience. Each stanza of the poem has three lines of four measures, followed by one of two measures, and is technically identical to the first four lines of Burns's favorite six-line verse. When we first encounter Saturn in Hyperion, he is quiet as a stone, still couchant on the earth, as Keats had seen these giant effigies of the ancient Scottish clansmen horizontal um, in the churchyard. They're now obviously in, indoors and in the museum. As the dark entrance of Fingal's cave came into view between its soaring columns of black basalt rock, it brought to mind the Celtic warrior Fingal, father of Macpherson's bard Ossian, last of all his race. Approaching more closely, Keats noticed a more homely detail. One may compare the surface of the island to a roof, he told his brother. What I think he meant was that viewed from the sea, Staffa's peculiar rock formations looked, and still look, like the carefully dressed edges of a thatched roof. Burns's cottage at Alloway, which Keats had recently visited, was thatched, and Fingal's cave would prove to be a poet's mansion too. With the sea dashing below, Keats stepped in Dr. Johnson's footsteps along the ledge of broken pillars as far as the cave's innermost point. The extremity of the cave, where he says he found a small perforation into another cave. For solemnity and grandeur, it far surpasses the finest cathedral, Keats informed Tom. So immense were the rock formations, they seem to have been carved by giants who rebelled against Jove. So step by step, the scenery of his epic was taking shape. 
The fallen titans are depicted in the poem on stony ledges and shelves, taken, I think, directly from Fingal's cave. This is the kind of thing he has in mind. Keats completed his letter to Tom by signing off with an extraordinary poem in which Milton's young poet, Lycidas, drowned and swept by sounding seas beyond the stormy Hebrides, is discovered in Fingal's cave, sleeping there on the marble cold and bare. Once again, as many times, Keats had been lured to some old cavern's mouth and the shadowy sound of a mighty poet, Milton, Ossian, and most ancient of them all, Orpheus. I think that the shape of Fingal's cave, culminating at its extremity in a small gap into another cave, had for Keats a kind of oracular significance as a mouthpiece of the gods, architected thus, he says, by the great Oceanus. All of these suggestions, all of these associations suggest that Keats was thinking further into his projected epic. There are striking resemblance, resemblances between poetic encounter on the marble cold and bare of Fingal's cave and Moneta's oracular pronouncements about poetry in the first canto of the fall of Hyperion. If thou canst not ascend these steps, Moneta tells Keats's poet dreamer, die on that marble where thou art. The steps that he has to climb towards poetic immortality were most likely recalled from Fingal's cave, slicked and smartened with classical marble to avoid the bathos of, if thou canst not ascend these steps, die on that basalt where thou art. Actually works quite well, doesn't it? True to the letter to Joseph Seven with which I began this talk, Keats had walked north and looked into beautiful scenery for poetic purposes, discovering poetry through tests and trials at thresholds, on edges, and at extremities of physical endurance and imaginative response. More than the miraculous May of 1819 and the suburban odes of that springtime of the living year, the footloose Keats of summer 18, 18 was perhaps most acutely attuned to his own imaginative restlessness. By Saturday the 1st of August, they were at Fort William, and at 5 a.m. on Sunday morning, set out with a guide and his dog to climb Ben Nevis by the mountain track, a strenuous but straightforward ascent from Glen Nevis to the summit above 4,000 feet above the sea. Later, Keats described how the mountain's immense head is composed of large stones, with chasms the finest wonder of the whole. They appear great rents in the very heart of the mountain. Astonishing, astonishingly, the summit of this gigantic mountain was also open to the depths. And Keats did what we're all told not to do. He threw down stones over the edge of the chasm to set the echoes at work in fine style. And then he sat a few feet from the edge of a precipice and he wrote a sonnet. Read me a lesson, muse, and speak it loud upon the top of Nevis, blind in mist. I look into the chasms and a shroud vaporeth doth hide them. Just so much I wist, mankind do know of hell. I look ahead, and there is sullen mist. Even so much mankind can tell of heaven. Mist is spread before the earth beneath me. Even such, even so vague is man's sight of himself. Here are the craggy stones beneath my feet. Thus much I know that a poor, witless elf, I tread on them. That all my eye doth meet is mist and crag, not only on this height, but in the world of thought and mental might. We see not the balance of good and evil. We are in a mist, Keats had written in a letter from Tynmouth. Here, now, Keats was literally blind in mist on Ben Nevis, 
and his poem had come to him while he was as sightless as the blind poet of Paradise Lost. But what was his muse's lesson? Thus much seems to be Keats' Keats's surmise. Thus much I know that I tread. And he goes on to describe for his brother how the slippery scree forced him to take a chance, sometimes on two, sometimes on three, sometimes four legs, sometimes two and stick, sometimes three and stick, then four again, then two. Then a jump, ringing changes on foot, hand, stick, jump, boggle, stumble, foot, hand, foot, very gingerly stick again, and then again a game at all fours. On Ben Nevis, every step was a gamble at risk of slip and fall, a hazardous, boggling balancing act that by ringing changes on foot moves onwards, much as an iambic pulse footing slow along the lines of his poems impels movement into realms of gold. The huge crags, the shattered heart and cloud veils of the mountain appealed to Keats's epic ambitions and his response was characteristic. Having stood tiptoe on a little hill at Hampstead, he now scrambled up a can of stones and, as he told Tom, so got a little higher than old Ben himself. That urge to reach higher and outclimb the peak of Ben Nevis is, for me, essential Keats, a reminder of how he had once gazed up at the daunting cliff of poetry he had determined to climb. By outsummiting the summit of old Ben, he reached another Keatsian extremity. It would be difficult, I think, to find a physical or imaginative location further from the windings of Southwark, or indeed the comf comforts of suburban Keatsland. With his Scottish tour cut short by his failing health, Keats now faced four long months of caring for his brother, who was in the final stages of tuberculosis. Weakened by the Scottish tour and with a recurrent sore throat, Keats was almost certainly infected with pulmonary consumption in the brother's apartment at Well Walk in Hampstead. Here it is. Um, their their uh, lodgings were actually where the, the, the pub is now, but the building one surmises, I surmise, was ident identical to that one. Their actual lodgings have, have disappeared, I'm afraid. As at Tynmouth during the previous spring, they were living in a small room that was most likely poorly ventilated, damp and heated by open coal fires an ideal environment for the airborne transmission of tuberculosis. Because they had no understanding of how tuberculosis was spread, their physical proximity was not an issue. That Tom was coughing up tubercular bacilli into the air breathed by his brother would not have crossed their minds once. Although Keats did admit darkly that not able to, that not able to leave him for more than a few hours he felt himself to be living in a continual fever. It must be poisonous to life, although I feel well. In an early poem, Keats had described little bright-eyed things that float about the air on azure wings. And from first to last, his poems are filled with the effects of breezes, breath and breathing, as if uncannily aware of the microscopic origin of tubercular infection, even though he had no rational conception of the insidious airborne things that were infecting his lungs. Keats's school friend, Charles Cowden Clark, visited the brothers at Well Walk during the autumn of 1818, and he thought that the situation there, in all probability, hastened Keats's own summons. He had travelled from the cloud and rain of Devon to the mists of Ben Nevis to a tubercular miasma at Well Walk. That the rod-shaped bacterium of pulmonary consumption was a microscopic version of the mighty rods of basalt in Fingal's cave was fortunately unknown to Keats. Release from this infected prison came through his earliest work on Hyperion, although progress was limited. For months he had been preparing his grand attempt at epic. 
beginning as far back as March 1817 with his visit to the British Museum and its awe-inspiring fragments of Grecian grandeur. There'd been further anticipations in Endymion and a letter to Hayden had announced that, unlike his poetic romance, his epic poem, the, in his epic poem, the march of passion and endeavour will be undeviating. He had made intensive study of Shakespeare, Milton, Carey's Dante and The Excursion, as well as L'Empriere's classical dictionary. And he had just returned from his trek around Scotland for poetical purposes. Even with all of these resources assembled, however, he found this long anticipated poem beset with difficulties. As he looked back, he saw himself setting about Endymion in a spirit of dauntless independence, whereas now he was paralysed by misgivings. In Endymion I leaped headlong into the sea, he told his publisher, who was all too aware, aware of his present hesitation. Since Endymion, all of his reading and speculations about the poetical character had now combined to make him pause. There was a social dimension too. Back then, his brothers George and Tom had given support, and fellow poets like Hunt, Reynolds, Clark and Matthew had all encouraged. Now, that nurturing community had fragmented, leaving Keats, confronted by the achievements of that Dante and Shakespeare, Milton and Wordsworth, suspecting that there was nothing original to be written in poetry. So there might have been further delay had, Ke had not Keats found himself obliged to write on Monday the 21st of September to ease his worry about Tom. As early autumnal rain scattered leaves along Well Walk, he set down the opening paragraph of Hyperion in 14 lines that are so subdued they seem to question the possibility of his poem proceeding further. Deep in the shady sadness of a veil, far sunken from the healthy breath of morn, far from the fiery noon and eve's one star, sat grey-haired Saturn, quiet as a stone. Still as the silence round about his lair, still as the silence round about his lair, forest on forest hung above his head like cloud on cloud. No stir of air was there, not so much life as on a summer's day robs not one light seed from the feathered grass, but where the dead leaf fell, there did it rest. A stream went voiceless by, still deadened more by reason of his fallen divinity spreading a shade. The naiad, mid her reeds, pressed her cold fingers closer to her lips. Commencing his epic with a blank verse sonnet, Keats began to master Milton's organic numbers in cadences tempered to an announcement of fallen divinity. The scene, I think, is a recollection of Shanklin Chine, the, the coastal gorge he had visited back in 1817. More intricately inward than anything Keats had written so far, his blank verse creates a complex lattice interwoven by alliteration, assonance, and half rhymes, while the naiad presses her cold finger closer to her lips, as if cautioning him to be silent. Keats intended these 14 lines to announce an epic narrative comprising thousands of lines, yet they might also have followed a more windingly introspective path and perhaps lapsed into voicelessness. As he embarked on his long projected poem, Keats's imagination was traveling in two directions, towards the shadowy inwardness of the Nightingale Ode, and more expansively, towards the wider horizons of epic narrative. We've seen these two dynamics in Keats throughout 1818, in his forays into the interiors of poets' houses at Rydalmount, Dumfries and Alloway, the mansion at Derry na Cullen where he wrote to Tom, and inside Fingal's cave where he had encountered Milton's Lycidas. At the same time, we have accompanied Keats to remotest Mull, Iona and Staffa, to the summit of Ben Nevis and the North Sea coast. 1818 had seen the departure of George and his wife to America 
and poor Tom's death on the 1st of December meant that Keats was now alone. Except for his sister Fanny, who was living at Walthamstow, he had no relatives that are known to us. Early one morning, Charles Brown recalled, I was awakened in my bed by a pressure on my hand. It was Keats who came to tell me his brother was no more. Had you not better live with me? Brown inquired. He paused, pressed my hand warmly, and replied, I think it would be better. And so 1819 came in with Keats moving from Wellwalk to Wentworth Place, where he was to remain as Brown's lodger until summer 1820. Their epic walk of the previous summer had fostered a warm friendship, and one could argue that the zigzagging path down from the summit of Ben Nevis led indirectly to the door of what is now Keats House in Keats Grove, Hampstead. I hope that what I've said this evening has convinced you that Keats's remarkably footloose life, roaming across the length and breadth of Britain, was also a life of creative continuities from place to place, as the significant locations of his life helped to shape his authorial identity. Equally, ideas of the labyrinth of escape from the city, the lure of the West, summits and thresholds, houses and caves, informed and embodied his thinking about poetry and the poems he created. In Isabella and Hyperion, he made huge advances in poetic technique, in narrative dynamics, and sustained creative energy, making imaginative strides that had vigorous counterparts in his remarkably active physical life. So perhaps I should conclude by returning to what I said at the outset, but with a slightly different emphasis. It now seems to me that the sedentary, physically immobile Keats that we see in Seven's portraits, seated, silent, intent, helped to form the Victorian's idea of a passive and a sickly Keats, an idea that, surprisingly perhaps, still persists today. Ironically, however, that idea of Keats was guaranteed by the vigorous actuality of the poet's life that the paintings decline to, have show, to show us. Much have we travelled in the course of this 2019 Keats Memorial Lecture. I hope you'll agree in winding up that attending to places, patterns and poetical purposes can tell us a good deal about how Keats came to poetry and about some of the lived origins of his extraordinary imaginative achievement. I'm not going to leave you uh, on the summit of Ben Nevis or even a peak in Darien or the depths of Fingal's Cave, um, but with a pleasing thought, I hope, that we're all here this evening within just a few yards of where so many of Keats's travels in the realms of gold actually began. I'm sure you'll all agree uh, what an incredible title and how brilliantly fulfilled it was, uh, linking uh, the place of Keats' life to his transcendent poetry uh, and showing how important uh, location was to him. Well, look, that brings us to the end of an absolutely splendid lecture. Uh, over the 50 years, this lecture has been given not only by many of the greatest Keats scholars, but by many of the great figures in poetry of the time. Uh, uh, we've heard uh, a contribution tonight, uh, which is totally worthy of the 50th lecture, uh, and please join me in thanking our lecturer for a wonderful contribution. Thank you.